Welcome to another episode of the Covenant Podcast. We are on the Man of God Network, brought to you by Covenant Baptist Theological Seminary. And as you have heard uh, from our introduction in our podcast clip, the Covenant Podcast exists to equip listeners with theological content from a 1689 Baptist perspective. And one of the ways that we like to do that on our show is just uh, giving biographical sketches of Calvinistic Baptists and talking about um, practical theology and what uh, faithful uh, Calvinistic Baptists of the past have taught us. So uh, we're really excited in this conversation to talk a little bit about Andrew Fuller and uh, preaching the Word of God, and more specifically, what Andrew Fuller can teach us about uh, preaching Jesus Christ from the text. And uh, to have that conversation, we're going to talk with uh, Dr. David Prince about his book, Preaching the Truth as It Is in Jesus. But before we uh, jump into the content of this book, welcome to the podcast, brother. It's, it's good to uh, have you on. Well, I appreciate you guys having me. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah. Uh, again, welcome to the show. We're thankful that you are uh, taking this time to have this conversation with us. We we really love Baptist history, and uh, we like uh, to learn about preaching, and so we're interested to have this conversation because both of those interests are going to be able to intersect in this conversation. But before we get into that, uh, Dr. Prince, can you just uh, introduce yourself to our audience since you're a first-time interviewee to our show? Yeah, sure. I grew up in uh, Montgomery, Alabama. I grew up in a non-Christian family, and I uh, Never went to church or anything like that, except maybe when my parents were keeping me busy, sending me to some vacation Bible school or something like that. But uh, grew up just uh, what I cared most about was playing athletics, and uh, that's what I did. And one time I was 19 years old, a friend invited me to church. He wasn't a godly guy or anything, but his family just went to church. And the pastor read the passage for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And uh, I remember it made me angry. I was like, who is he to say that about me? And uh, when I got home, I decided I was going to find a Bible. Um, didn't own one. My sister had one of those mural ones with a zipper on the side. And I eventually found that in her room. And I decided I was going to read the book of Romans to go back and prove him wrong. Well, if you're looking for self-justifications, Romans is a really bad place to go. <laughs> Romans has slayed the hearts of uh, far greater men than me. And by the time I was uh, in about Romans chapter five, um, uh, the few things I'd learned uh, from the Bible in my life, John three sixteen and other things were floating back into my mind. And when they say Christ died for the ungodly, I knew I was the ungodly. And um, uh, I cried out for God and had to save me. I was 18 years old. I was in college playing baseball. And uh, he did. And uh, within about... Um, Within about six months, uh, I felt a call to ministry, which uh, frightened me. I, I didn't even know yet uh, when to stand up and sit down in church. Uh, but, but I really was given a voracious hunger for God's word. God brought an expository preacher to the church that I started attending and uh, really accelerated my passion for the scripture. I'd never really heard anything like what he was doing. Uh, but when I got done playing baseball, I went into coaching. I coached several years. Um, but I never could shake it. I got married to my uh, college girlfriend. And uh, one day I came in and I said, I, you know, I was studying Isaiah 55 last night as high as the heavens are above the earth. My ways are higher than yours, honey. And uh, I, I've been struggling this for years and I just think I'm called to ministry and I need to go get trained somewhere. Uh, so her response was, well, I've been waiting on you. And uh so we ended up going to moving to Fort Worth, Texas and going to Southwestern Seminary where I got my uh, MDiv. Um, after that, um, uh, I ended up going to Southern Seminary and um, really resonated with the vision and direction that Dr. Moeller was taking the seminary and uh, went there to do a Ph.D., but wanted to pastor. My heart is in the church um, and the turnaround was so fresh at the seminary and for a guy who resonated with what was happening at the seminary uh, that wasn't going too well and talking to churches looking for a ministry opportunity so I ended up leaving and going and pastoring a church in the Birmingham area but God opened a door a few years later for me to um, to come here where I am now at Ashland Avenue 
uh, in Lexington, and uh, I did that and jumped back in the PhD program and uh, finished PhD Southern Seminary. I've been uh, teaching at Southern Seminary now for 16 years, uh, preaching in pastoral ministry, and I've been here as the pastor of Ashland Avenue Baptist Church for 19 years. Uh, and so God has blessed my life richly. I've been married in December. It will be 30 years. And uh, I have eight children. My three oldest are boys and my five youngest are girls. It's a little bit about my background and uh, how God brought me to where I am today. Amen. Well, that's such an encouraging testimony and an overview of, of your life and ministry. Dr. Prince, I can resonate a lot with what you said. I actually didn't get saved my senior year. I uh, got called into ministry during the first semester of my uh, time playing college baseball. So uh, anytime I hear a, a testimony of somebody who got saved not only later in life, but uh, felt the call to ministry playing baseball or some sort of sport in college, that's that's always an encouragement to me. So uh, we're so grateful to have you on to, uh, the show today. And uh, as uh, our listeners will notice from the show description, the title of your most recent book is Preaching the Truth as it is in Jesus, a reader on Andrew Fowler. And I, I know we're going to talk a lot about that book over the course of today's show, but maybe to get us started, um, would you be willing to share with our listeners about why you wrote this book in the first place, as well as maybe provide our listeners with a flyover sketch of the book and, and the intended audience for this book? Yeah, well, the reason I wrote the book was because um, Andrew Fowler has been a part of my daily life now for about two decades. Um, when I was a, a PhD student, um, I heard Dr. Tom Nettles give a lecture on Andrew Fuller one time, which really piqued my interest. I had a conversation with, uh, with him, and I, I talked to some other people. And, uh, but one of the things that Nettles said was nobody should be allowed to have a PhD at Southern Theological Seminary who didn't read the complete works of Andrew Fuller. Uh, and so I got the sprinkle edition of Fuller's life, I mean, Fuller's works, and uh, I just started reading. And uh, I absolutely was, um, was overwhelmed with uh, his pastoral wisdom, his clarity, his passion, uh, his, his desire to reach the world with the gospel. And uh, I've continued the practice for two decades now of reading a little bit of Andrew Fuller uh, every single day. And so uh, Fuller is not only part of my life, but um, uh, because I was so influenced by him, uh, he certainly any student who's taken me at Southern Seminary will know he's a part of my lectures. And uh, in my preaching class particularly it became uh, a practice where I would say, well, Andrew Fuller says this better than I can. And I would uh, collect parts Fuller writings uh, and uh, uh, provide them to my students. And so over time, I had identified all of the places in Fuller's works where he specifically talked about preaching or challenged about preaching or our pastoral ministry. And, and so uh, I wanted to share uh, Fuller uh, in that way with uh, as many people as I possibly could. Uh, you know, there, uh, Michael Haken, one of the colleagues at Southern Seminaries. Uh, one of the great Fuller scholars. I've been influenced by Pierre Morden's work. Uh, I'm excited that there's somewhat of a re renaissance of studies about Andrew Fuller in the last uh, 10 to 15 years. Uh, but what I wanted to hone in on particular, in particular, was uh, what Fuller had to say about preaching, and by extension, what he had to say uh, to preachers, what he had to say about preparing sermons, about preaching Christ, about the preacher parent himself. Uh, and I identified what I thought, uh, what I think is a, sort of a way to summarize Fuller's approach to everything he was involved in. And that is he uses this repeated phrase throughout all of his works and all of the different top topics. He keeps referring back to uh, the truth as it is in Jesus, a phrase that comes from the Apostle Paul in Ephesians 4.21. And so I started reading Fuller's works and just identifying every single time he uses that phrase, uh, what the topic was and uh, working it out. So so in relation to everything he deals with, uh, that phrase is a very um, uh, concise way to say what he's doing 
working as he deals with all these different topics. And so uh, what I wanted to do was put the uh, preaching book together, pulling together all of the key readings that Fuller has on preaching and uh, add some introductory information and sort of uh, give my thoughts on what he's an overview of what he's doing uh, in the in the four main sections of the book and sort of just help the reader to gain some understanding of the historical situation and uh, the way Fuller is putting it together before uh, they have the readings. And so, um, you know, uh, I have a desire to turn on as many uh, people as I can to Fuller. He's been my uh, historical mentor uh, all these years, and uh, I've never really had anybody that I got to actually start reading Fuller uh, who who wasn't glad that they did. And so that's how the book kind of came about and uh, why I, I wrote it. If you want me to, I'll talk a little bit about the life of Andrew Fuller and why I think it's so significant. Is that something you want me to do now? Yeah, that was the next part of our conversation that we were going to transition to. Uh, we we uh, likewise uh, really love Andrew Fuller, and we want you to share your interest with this man and whom you've spent a lot of time studying about uh, by giving our audience a biographical sketch, uh, if you'd be willing to. And also, I want to mention that uh, in the book you write, above all else, Andrew Fuller was a gospel preacher. So can you uh, include um, that element of Fuller as you give uh, a biographical sketch of him? Yeah, sure. Well, Fuller was an English Baptist pastor, a probably better called pastor theologian, uh, which is uh, something I think we all need to aspire to. Everybody's a theologian. It's just whether or not we're a good one or not. Uh, we need to recognize that a pastor has a responsibility to be a theologian to the people he ministers to. But uh, an English Baptist pastor who was born in 1754 and died in 1815, who had this incredible influence. Um, uh, you know, Spurgeon called um, Fuller the, the greatest theologian of his century. Uh, William Carey's great grandson, S. Pierce Carey, said more than anyone else, uh, Fuller rescued the churches from uh, fatalism and he saved the day, uh, Carey's great grandson said, and that he was the unrivaled captain of uh, mission. Uh, of, of getting the gospel to the world, the gospel mission. Uh, so, so Fuller, uh, some people refer to him as the elephant of Kettering because he cast such a big shadow on that part of the world. Uh, uh, S. Pierce Carey also said that, uh, you know, it's, uh, it, it's right to associate Fuller's name with uh, the global gospel missions movement because he was the, found, the theological underpinning. Here's a guy who never went to the mission field himself, uh, but uh, is one of the reasons uh, for the modern missionary movement, one of the catalysts for it, the, the theological underpinnings of it all. And so uh, he, he, was a, he was a guy who um, early on uh, had little interest in Christ, but uh, then started having a sense of conviction. But he was, he was mired in an era where predominantly uh, false Calvinism is what he calls it. We would say hyper Calvinism or high Calvinism ruled the day. And the, the idea of um, the, uh, no one should even ask a question about whether they believe uh, without discerning whether or not uh, they're elect, because only the elect have the warrant to believe. And so he, uh, he struggled and he struggled mildly with his own uh, uh, thinking about uh, himself, and he he, uh, he came to faith uh, in Christ, and and he started having he started struggling with this issue, and uh, ultimately he he became someone who who fought the false Calvinism of his day, and um, he argued uh, you know very um, vehemently for a, a warrant of faith and. Uh, you know, he was influenced early on by, um, by John Bunyan. Uh, he read, uh, you know, Bunyan's Grace Abounding, and he read Pilgrim's Progress, and he read uh, Erskine's Gospel Sonnets, um, influenced also somewhat by Calvin. Uh, 
And uh, then John Owen was probably early on for uh, Fuller, his his main uh, person that he leaned on. And then toward later on in his ministry, it's more Jonathan Edwards. And so we get a lot of Fuller popularized ideas uh, that he gets from Edwards. But but Fuller was somebody who who took on all of the challenges of his day to the gospel. And he did it for the sake of uh, the local church and ultimately the church's responsibility for global missions. And, and so not only did he take on the false high Calvinism and argue for the free offer for the gospel and that uh, every person uh, has a duty to believe in Christ, and he, he there he latched on to Edward's distinction between uh, inability being uh, a moral inability versus natural inability. And the, 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 the idea of, of uh, natural inability being a lack of rational faculties to believe or, or um, some external advantages uh, rather than moral inability be completely one responsibility because uh, they just simply um, um, had within them uh, an adverse attitude to the gospel. And so, so uh, with it being moral, therefore it's criminal. It's you're you're guilty for it, rather than the idea that uh, so all people have the natural ability to believe, uh, but they do not have uh, a, a a heart of faith. We we believe in depravity. Fuller believed in depravity, uh, but we are accountable for our unbelief because we actually are the ones who do not believe. And so he, he extends this out and argues for uh, what he called the promiscuous preaching of the gospel, uh, the free offer of the gospel to, to all men without exception. And um, uh, gospel worthy of all acceptation is the key work there. Uh, but, uh, you know, he also dealt with uh, Socinianism, uh, Sandemanianism, he dealt with antinomianism, uh, he dealt with deism. All of the attacks of the gospel of his day, he, he spoke to, and he spoke to with clarity. And one of the great things about Fuller is his carefulness. Like Fuller is able to uh, take on the opponents of the gospel in both directions with equal clarity. So not only is he attacking the high Calvinism, but he's attacking Arminianism. Uh, not only is he attacking in one direction here, but the other direction. And so he, he writes with this clarity. But it's not just clarity, it's a pastoral clarity. Uh, and this is why I'm, I'm such a champion of Fuller. I, I love Jonathan Edwards, but uh, reading Jonathan Edwards is a challenge for anybody, <laughs> even Edwards scholars, right? Uh, Edwards goes into all kinds of uh, directions, drifts into all kinds of philosophical discussions. And so what, what Fuller does, I, is just appropriate these key ideas in Edwards, but everything with Fuller is oriented toward uh, a very concrete, practical application in a local church, and by extension, local churches and the spread of the gospel. And so, so, so Fuller writes what he writes, even as he deals with the enemies of the gospel of the day, as he what we would refer to as apologetics, as he does that as a local church pastor with a view to pulpit ministry and the responsibility of a local church to take the gospel to the ends of the earth. And when he weighs in on all of these subjects, there is a very practical pastoral focus. One of the other things that um, you see in Fuller that uh, is an echo of the influence of Edwards in his life is that um, there is a key focus uh, in Fuller on loving the church love the people you pastor, and uh, uh, affections in ministry. He's always warning about the danger of an unfelt gospel. And so if you think about all the things that I'm saying and the influence that he had in launching the modern missionary movement and dealing with the enemies of the gospel of the day, but doing it as a pastor, the, the tension in what he's doing always has a rootedness and a groundedness in the local church. And so it's always concrete. It's always, uh, we could say, practical. Uh, but, but this is important for us to remember for a lot of reasons. 
One is that's the very nature of ministry. Uh, all of us tend to, to lean in a certain direction. Uh, you know, some people like more abstract dialogue about theology and all kinds of other things. Other people uh, are more really um, rooted and grounded with relationships and people. Uh, some people are really have a heart for the nations. Other people are really, but, but we've actually got to do all of that. And, and Fuller does all of that and models how you can engage these larger discussions but for the benefit of your local church and other local churches. And he also teaches us something really important because one of the things that you always get historically, and you certainly see it today, is the way we can be more mission-focused is to be less theological. <laughs> you know, when, when we enter into all these discussions and we debate all of these things, we're actually taking the focus off of reaching people. Well, that's completely untrue. <laughs> and the truth is, without the victory that God gave Fuller in relation to enemies in all kinds of directions, you don't have the modern missionary movement. Uh, the, the, the gospel that we take to the world always has to have a clarity to it. And, and certainly we can over-argue uh, all kinds of things and turn intramural dialogues into more than they are. But that's not the greater danger, especially in our age. The, the greater danger is that we forsake the fundamentals of gospel truth for the sake of practical ministry. Fuller reminds us that we should not do that. And he reminds us that as we weigh in all of these different uh, dialogues, uh, that uh, we don't need to take our eyes off the people that we preach to. Uh, and we don't need to take our eyes off the responsibility that we have uh, to the larger world. But that means that we've got to retain the truth of the gospel in our own uh, local church, in our own community. Another reason why I think Fuller is is so important um, is that one of the things about thinking about Fuller, who spent 40 years as a pastor, 32 in his uh in his uh, second church, uh, the church at Kettering, uh, is that, um, uh, you know, Fuller's context is so much uh, more analogous to our context than, say, even the reformers, who we certainly should study, learn from, and appreciate. But, but the world that they were living in and the nature of the enemies they were facing uh, has less to do than uh, our own context has to do uh, when we when we look at Fuller because uh, in, in Fuller's world he is he's dealing with uh, a world where a lot of the attacks on the gospel are are based on reason and rationalism and attacks on the gospel and we can correspond to attacks today. Um, and so the, the nature of the way the faith was being attacked uh, is um, in Fuller is a lot more connected to the world that we actually live and minister in and the attacks on the gospel today. And, and I think the reason uh, Fuller later on tilted toward Edwards as his primary influence is because Edwards was um, more closely aligned to the issues and the generation that that he's actually dealing with. Uh, Edwards died four, four years after Fuller was born. Uh, um, I think that's right. Uh, whereas, you know, uh, Owen is 17th century. Uh, and, and so um, he found a voice uh, that uh, he, could, he could listen to that helped him deal more with the issues and attacks on the gospel that they were facing in his time. Uh, and so... Uh, one of the things that you'll you'll notice if you read Fuller a lot is there aren't many of the discussions that are dated. <laughs> like the way he's dealing with a heartfelt ministry and the way he's dealing with these fundamental attacks uh, on the gospel and the connection between the, the, the world that he lived in and the world that we live in. Uh, maybe new names today for a lot of these things. But the nature of what he was dealing with is so timely uh, for us. But, but the, the voice of a local church pastor who speaks in very clear and concrete terms 
ties everything to the local church, even when he deals with these things that affect the church globally, is something that I think um, that uh, um, uh, we ought to point as many people as we can to this faithful brother because he has much to teach us for our day. And, and just at a practical level, uh, I'll ask somebody, do you have trouble understanding Edwards? <laughs> do you have less trouble understanding Fuller? So uh, uh, if you appreciate Edwards, uh, get some of Edwards' stuff distilled uh, down through Fuller, and you'll be thankful for me later. <laughs> That's very well said. Uh, just in response to your question, um, Andrew Fuller is a lot easier to read than Jonathan Edwards from uh, my personal experience. So um, no question that uh, Fuller was very balanced. And, and I really like that about him and how you drew that out, Dr. Prince, that he was involved with many theological controversies. He was he was involved with missions. Uh, he was involved with relationships that were relevant to his role as a pastor. Um, but he never allowed those things to detract from his his affection for Christ or his his Christocentric emphasis uh, in his ministry and in his preaching. And we know from scripture that that's really at the heart and task of the preacher to, to preach Christ and him crucified uh, and, and to, to set forth the gospel um, to both the local yeah. church and of course to the, the nations as well. Um, but to transition on that note, Dr. Prince, um, what, what specific lessons can we learn from Dr. Fuller about preaching Christ? And um, is, is there anything particular to Fuller's philosophy of preaching that can can give us insight as to how we can better preach Christ ourselves in the 21st century. Yeah, well, uh, absolutely. There are all kinds of things. Uh, and, uh, you know, that, that phrase, the truth as it is in Jesus. So Fuller would say things like, I believe the truth as it is in Jesus. Uh, to believe that is to believe the whole doctrine of Scripture. So, so. So Fuller is basically doing biblical theology. Uh, he, he says that um, it is at Christ and uh, the cross of Christ, and by that he implies resurrection too, but it, where all lines of biblical doctrine meet. Uh, and, and so he's advocating this Christ-centered biblical theology through all of his conversations about preaching. And then when we see the sermons, he's modeling it as well. And so he believed that uh, to, to faithfully preach, you had to preach Christ. Now, now he gave warnings about um, um, unhealthy allegory. Uh, but those warnings about allegory were, were oriented toward um, uh, making up arbitrary connections and imposing them upon the scripture. Uh, he certainly believed and taught and, and very clearly uh, stated uh, you know, he says that uh, similar to Spurgeon, if you're not going to preach Christ, you shouldn't preach. <laughs> that 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 all of the lines of biblical uh, truth ultimately have to be drawn to Christ. And so he says, a uh, uh, DA concerning the person and work of Christ is always followed by a dereliction of almost every other evangelical doctrine. Uh, that's one of the things he says. So, so if you get Christ wrong, you're going to get uh, all kinds of doctrine wrong. And he says it uh, uh, to fail to preach Christ is to uh, reject the very spirit of Christianity. Uh, he says if the foundation falls, the building must fall. Uh, and so the truth as it is in Jesus is what he keeps coming to again and again and again. So, so for, for him, preaching always involves the uh, understanding of how the line of the text in its own context connects to Christ. So Christ is a, a key uh, to our preaching. Um, the, um, uh, uh, he, he models this again and again so helpfully uh, and effectively and very uh, practically. And so, so when, he, when he talks about preaching, and he talks about preaching uh, uh, Christ. Uh, he he's not um, uh, doing what uh, some would do today and use the idea of preaching Christ uh, to reject an expositional model of preaching. No, he, he's clearly advocating what we would refer to as expository preaching, uh, and he's he's calling preachers to um, 
uh, one of the important things that he says that I press into my students uh, is, is he emphasizes uh, your responsibility to, to read the scripture, right? Well, that sounds simple, but, but he points out a problem that we still have today is that many people go first to commentaries about scripture and before they go to the scripture. And he says, you've got it all backwards. You should read the scripture and think upon the scripture and try to understand the scripture before you ever go, in the, go to any other helps. When you go to the other helps, he's not uh, against commentaries and, and, and reading uh, theological writings at all. He did it. But, but he does understand the fact that uh, you must deal with the scripture personally. He, he talks about this throughout. That um, the danger is that he says that 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 some people uh, in preaching become like soldiers on a battlefield, and that is that when the war first starts, they see the sight of blood and they wince. But the longer they're on the battlefield, the more cold and hardened they are to the realities that they are dealing with. He says people get like that in preaching, so it's a dangerous thing to learn how to be able to. Together, because when you learn how to put together a sermon, if that's all you're going for, so he says you shouldn't go to the scriptures first of all to have something to say to somebody else. You should go to the scriptures first of all for yourself. And so one of the themes that comes up again and again is that everything a pastor does, he should do as a Christian first and a minister next. If you read his ordination sermons, that line is replete throughout them. Do what you do as a Christian first. So if somebody's going to preach Christ faithfully, they have to actually read the scriptures and understand the scriptures. And he talks about um, he talks about pursuing the spiritual meaning of the text. And what he means by that language is the biblical theological meaning of the text, the larger gospel implications of a given text. So he's advocating going to a text and understanding. In its own context, but always your goal is to understand where that text fits into redemptive history and to preach that text faithfully because it's dealt with you first as a believer. So you've gone to that text as a Christian seeking to understand it. And then, and only then, do you try to come up with, with something to say in the context of a sermon. So it's a felt message that you're going to preach to others. He, he, um, he uses all kinds of illustrations about the danger of, of growing hardened uh, to what you're doing. And so this is, again, a reflection of influence, I think, of Edwards on uh, the affections um, that, that Fuller never, uh, ever loses sight of. And so, so Fuller would say in relation to preaching, you must preach the text. And it's a text that you have committed yourself to understanding before you sought any other helps. And then once you get those, uh, your, what you're thinking of, uh, about at that point is, is um, how to communicate the text clearly. And so uh, Fuller, like so many, all of these issues are, are, are totally contemporary when you talk about preaching. So like, like so many down through the ages in the classic works on uh, preaching, uh, Fuller emphasizes a clear style of preaching. Uh, he, he talks about not using uh, finical terminology and, and not using, using plain speech and speaking with clarity. He also warns against um, dividing up your sermon in a way that makes mincemeat out of it. He says that endless headings and subheadings are not what you're doing in preaching. And that preaching is not about the right place, period or even the right turn of phrase. And so it's not like writing an essay. It's not about getting everything together in just the right way. And he says there's a danger in that. And so somebody who has too many headings and subheadings turns it into mincemeat. And nobody says wants mincemeat. Uh, and so, so he says, keep your headings to a few. Don't have a ton of headings. Have headings and have headings that are, are clear and easy to follow. And he talks about the fact that uh, one of the things he emphasizes is 
a unity of design in sermons. And so he warns about sermons that just talk about ideas, but don't link them together. And so your headings are not just sort of, this is an idea, this is a different idea. So I say preaching is not like going to the zoo, right? There's a bear, there's a different cage, there's a lion, there's a, no, it's more like a, a roller coaster that's all connected together that has movement. But Fuller is advocating this unity of design. And he talks about a simplicity of your structure, that your headings are few, they are clearly biblical, they are oriented toward the meaning of the text in relation to Christ, because he says every sermon should be on a gospel errand. If your sermon does not go on a gospel errand, it's not a Christian sermon. But but so you have these these headings, and then he, he provides a warning. I, I I give a list in the book of a summary of the way he puts this together in his his most direct piece that he writes on sermon preparation. But 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 he says that really though that that your headings uh, uh, don't really matter unless you actually. Uh, have a felt understanding of the text. Do you see how again and again he warns about sort of uh, preaching just become a mechanical operation that you uh, learn how to do, or that you parrot the words of somebody else? He gets a, he gives a warning about preaching someone else's sermons. All right, uh, same problem we have uh, today that uh, we see in our midst. Uh, but but so we've got a unity of design. We have felt it personally because we've been immersed in the scripture. We understand the gospel errand that the sermon's on. And we, he, 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 he says this in the end, that we prepare the sermon without respect to consequences in this life. What a powerful warning. It says, you don't prepare what you say in your sermon based on any consequence that you think you might face in this life. In other words, you're not trying to figure out what you're allowed to say. You just simply are going to say what the Scripture says, no matter what the consequences are. And so you get the, the passion that he's calling you to preach with, the, the courage, the clarity. But, but if I were to take sort of everything I just walked you through and say, okay, Let's get that down in a, in a few less headings. It would be something like this. Uh, Fuller calls for biblical position. Many of us call expository preaching. Verse by verse exposition of the scripture. Uh, but in that verse by verse exposition of the scripture, he calls us to be clear. And that's clear on a couple of fronts. Clear with our language preaching in a way that the people that we're preaching to can understand what we're saying, clear about the message of the text, also clear about the gospel, the gospel errand that the sermon is on. And the third category, if we were to put it down in three categories, is that you preach a sermon that you have felt, that is a felt gospel to you, because only then will it become a felt gospel to the people that you're preaching to. The, the, those would be the, the ways to sort of shrink it down, uh, the most sort of uh, uh, simple way that, that I could say it. Well, all of those things are absolutely important for us to learn, but not only learn, but to imbibe and to live out today. You think about the preaching that uh, you know uh, and the preaching, the mistakes uh, uh, that are out there in preaching. Right? Some people avoid the text. Uh, some people jump, go away from the text too quickly. Some people speak in language that people can't understand. I mean, I've heard all kinds of brothers preach, and what they're saying is, is true, uh, but they might not necessarily be the way the text is saying it. In other words, they're abstracting it up to say systematic theological categories too quickly? Are they using language that the people they're preaching to don't understand? Are the guys that are like TV anchor people, they're just giving you information, but it, it's obvious it's not felt? So the lack of clarity, the lack of feeling it, the lack of passion, the failure to be faithful to scripture, 
And the failure to be faithful to Scripture comes in two different directions. One, we abandon the Scripture. But secondly, we use the Scripture, but we don't really preach the Scripture. We jump to something else we want to talk about too quickly. And in our circles, a lot of guys do that, and they talk good theology, but they just use the text as like a diving board into what they wanted to talk about, which was kind of systematic categories, more so than dealing with the text as it actually comes to us in terms of biblical theology. Fuller's doing all of it. And Fuller's helps in that, and his, his, um, his uh, illustrations are as timely today as they were uh, when he wrote them. So, so Fuller says in his diary, he says, Christ and his cross be my theme. I love his name and I wish to make it the center in which all the lines of my ministry meet. So, so not only is it the, 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 the place in which all of the lines of biblical truth meet, but he wants to make it the, the center in which all of the lines of his ministry meet. He does that. He does that in the pulpit. He does that as he engages the theological controversies of his day. And he does that in the way he argues for and advocates for uh, world missions as well. This has been uh, really interesting to get some applications from Fuller about uh, his preaching philosophy. And another thing that you've been alluding to a lot in your answer that we're uh, curious to know if you have more to say uh, is what can what can Fuller teach us about the preparing of the sermon itself? I know you've already alluded to this. You've talked about how the sermon must be felt by the minister whenever he's preparing the text. Um, but do you have any further comments that you want to make about preparation of the sermon or uh, anything else in your book that you want to draw out that you write about, about Fuller and the preparation of the message? Yeah, I mean, uh, just uh, the, the the categories that he constantly comes back to are that um, that that you have to spend the time in the text, that you have to uh, minimize the uh, headings that you're going to proclaim, and that you need to get them down in really clear terminology. He 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 says that stuff that you write you should take with to the pulpit. And so he's advocating an ex extemporaneous style of preaching. Uh, I don't think he means there that you take nothing to the pulpit. Uh, I think we've got reason to believe that's not the case. But what he means is that everything that you write down, you don't take to the pulpit. This is a part of the connection and the feltness that he's trying to communicate uh, with his preaching, and that you're always doing biblical theology and trying to understand the gospel errand of the text. Those are those are key categories that he wants you to think about uh, as you uh, prepare, actually sit down and prepare a sermon. Don't go to the commentaries too quick. Uh, understand the text on its own terms. Understand the text in terms of the, the Bible as a whole. And um, you're, sh you're shooting for clarity and feltness uh, to the people you're preaching to. And what's normative is you just go verse by verse through uh, text of the Bible. We see that he does that. Uh, in industry, just going, uh, you know, you find his, his sermons basically turned into kind of a commentary on Genesis and, and, and other works today. And he's just going verse by verse expositionally uh, through the scripture. But, uh, you know, some of the ma his main focus is, as he's talking to preachers uh, about this is, is not just the actual preparing of the sermon. But uh, the, the last section of the book is dealing with the preparation of the, the preacher himself. And um, one of the things that, that, that Fuller emphasizes again and again that, that I think we need to emphasize more today is, is a love for the people you're preaching to, a, a love for the church, but not just the church in a general sense but the church in terms of the people that you're preaching to. So, so in his diary at times, uh, Fuller laments that he, he's doing so many things that he says, uh, I don't know the cases of my people in the way that I ought to preach to them more effectively. The cases, the, the situations in their lives. And so this, this issue of, of loving the people that you're preaching to is, is paramount with Fuller in preparing yourself. 
just as doing what you do as a Christian first before a minister in everything that you do. Uh, and uh, one of the things Dr. Haken has pointed out that, that Fuller doesn't talk about as specifically, uh, but uh, you, you see um, uh, people mentioning this in relation to Fuller, is that um, Fuller understood that to be the most faithful minister he could be in his local church, he had to have gospel friendships with men that were going to challenge him. So, uh, you know, he was put on to Edwards by a friend who gave him a book. Uh, um, and those relationships he understood eventuated into him being a more faithful uh, minister to the people that he preached to uh, every week. And then, then um, I, I think one of the things that we learned from Fuller that, that affects our, our preaching, I don't think that Fuller thought that the, the way he was defending the faith and the larger issues was harmful to his local church ministry, or rather it was being leveraged for it. So this defense of the gospel in the larger Christian world uh, was absolutely a positive for his congregation and the people he preached for, defending the gospel. And, and uh, that his work in the missionary work around the world was because he loved the church. Uh, he wanted the, 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 the witness of the church to be expanded around the world. And so these things were complementary uh, for his pastoral ministry that he thought made him a, a more effective minister. Now, you know, there's some there's some debate on whether Fuller was too busy. Uh, his wife certainly told him at times he was too busy. Um, and she said, you know, you need you need some recreation. He said, my recreation is a change of activity. So the recreation was going from the defending the faith to the focus on the mission work to the uh, and that's just the way. He thought. So so for Fuller being busy was not a bad thing. And we can decide if we, as we study him in his life, whether we think he got the balance right. But he thought this comprehensive engagement was important because he did see himself as a pastor theologian. He was only going to be as faithful as he could in his church as if he cared about the gospel movement at a large level. You know, one of my favorite things about Fuller was a big, uh, seemed to be a, a big guy who, who at one time was a wrestler. He, he, he said that he, he used to, when he saw somebody, he'd look the guy up and down and size up whether he thought he could take, take him or not. Uh, I resonate with some of that. But he also had a sign in his office that said, um, a man who steals my purse steals my money. A man who steals my time steals my life. So he would stand at the, in the doorway, and if somebody was taking too much of his time, he would start glancing up at the sign as a, a, a communicator to them that, uh, okay, we need to move on to be about other things. And so, but, but again, like with everything that I just said to you, what you see with Fuller is the attempt at this balance. Like he wants to know the cases of his people. He understands sometimes he's not with his people enough, but he also understands the necessity to guard his time and to be somebody who has to pull away so he can read the scripture and have it felt in his own life so he, so he doesn't preach an unfelt gospel. And understand that the global task had something to do with his local task of preaching the gospel in his local church and, and dealing with the issues that he faces in his own congregation had everything to do with his willingness to speak to the larger issues. Balance, beautiful balance. Uh, in ministry that that produces a uh, a well-rounded ministry that I think you can look in all the different directions and say, you know, uh, he is far from perfect, but he was trying to do the right things in all of the important directions of ministry. Now, you know what what you don't get is a focus on a lot of the things that we focus on today. Uh, of, of just simply, you know, entertainment, or brand build, you know, not, but all the important issues, uh, being a man of the word, the, uh, being willing to speak the truth to the issues of the day, but doing it for the sake of actual missions locally and to the ends of the earth, pastoring a local church. I think that the choices that he made about the investment of his time 
uh, is, is, is vital for us to learn from him. And, and I think if we read his sermons, if we read what he said about preaching, we're going to get the balance right on all of those things as well. You know, there's some people who advocate Christ-centered preaching, but every sermon is just sort of a redemptive homily that's only loosely connected to the text. Well, Fuller says no go. Expositional preaching must be it. There, there are expositional preaching today who that, that is in the text, but it basically abstracts the text from the larger biblical story. And so jumps immediately to propositions to apply today without being mediated through Christ and the gospel. He says, no, no good at that either. And so all of these areas in which we tend to err, I think Fuller gives us a good call to a biblical balance. And he's doing it in a world that is enough like ours that we can really be helped by, by understanding uh, what he had to say more uh, faithfully. We've been talking with Dr. David Prince about his new book, Preaching the Truth as It Is in Jesus, a reader on Andrew Fuller. And it's just been an absolutely rich discussion on the life ministry and preaching of Andrew Fuller. Dr. Prince, before we wrap up our time together today, I wonder if you'd be willing to share some final encouragements related to Andrew Fuller or just preaching in general. I know we have many listeners who are pastors in their local church or aspiring pastors, uh, aspiring ministers who are currently being trained. Uh, for the ministry at this time. So maybe you could share a few final words of encouragement to them about Fuller or about preaching, or maybe even a combination of the two. Sure. First of all, related to the book, uh, the book is about uh, uh, Fuller and uh, his view of preaching, but um, I don't think that's the only people that the book will help. Uh, A lot of people in my own congregation have read the book, and so they're like, oh, I get it. Like, like I know something's different about the way you go about what you're doing. Uh, and uh, I think that uh, a, a uh, interested uh, lay person uh, can, can be helped from the book as well. Uh, and so I'd encourage it to be used in that way. Uh, and, and to be honest with you, I mean, Fuller is just so, um, so uh, constantly devotional uh, that, uh, that, you always end up, I think, when you read him, just pausing and thinking about some some key things that he said. And since everything is a Christian first, uh, any Christian is going to benefit from from thinking about him. But but in terms of pastoral ministry, uh, you know, I think the things that that I have uh, gained from Fuller that I think is is a real um, uh, necessity today is. Um, just, just to be frank with you, I, I find a lot of people who spend what I would think is far too much uh, time complaining about the difficulties of ministry and, and almost um, um, having an attitude of uh, a negative attitude about what it means to be a, a preacher of the gospel because of the challenges that we face. Listen, every minister of the gospel has faced challenges. If you, if you read a little history, the self-pity that so many uh, so quickly delve into is wiped away. We face incredible challenges, but so is everyone else. Fuller reminds me constantly that this is a privilege. And a part of Fuller's emphasis on the, the, the global spread of the gospel I think is one of the things that kept his heart so hot for Christ and his preaching so uh, passionate because he never lost a sense of, of what this is that, that he was involved in, that God allowed somebody like him. Uh, you know, he's largely self-taught like, like Spurgeon uh, to, to be involved in. And uh, that's, that's where I think most of us sit. I, I think the problem that we have oftentimes is, is not the challenges we face, but that we don't think about the challenges we face in the context of the privilege of what we've been called to. And, and the fact that, that, that God's just calling us to be faithful, faithful in our time, to speak the things that need to be spoken, to do it with a view to Christ and the gospel at all times, and to realize that he lets people like us. <laughs> it's a, he, he calls some guy who had never even uh, thought about uh, Christianity, uh, never cared about anything but playing sports, and now he lets me do this. And the challenge that I, I face for my opportunity to be faithful to Christ, 
So, so I, I would say, brothers, realize what it means that Christ has, has called us to this. Find you a historical uh, mentor, uh, uh, not hero. Christ is our hero. But there are those who have been faithful that can help us in our time. Uh, I think that a lot of times we're, we're too myopic with the way we approach the scripture. So we ignore the biblical storyline. And we're too myopic with the way we approach thinking about our lives. We ignore uh, the storyline of what God has done throughout the ages. This is a privilege. Let's, let's, um, let's move ahead with a sense of wonder. Christ called us to. And I think somebody like Fuller has helped me uh, see that and reminds me of that constantly. And I think he can help others too. Very well said, Dr. Prince. It's been a treat having you on the Covenant podcast today. We want to thank you so much for your scholarship and just for your commitment to exalting our Lord Jesus Christ and all that he's called you to do. Keep up the great work, brother. Uh, we're greatly encouraged by your labors. Thank you. I'm so thankful that you had me and enjoyed it. Love to talk to you guys anytime. Yes, sir. And to our listeners, we want to thank you for joining us for today's show. As always, uh, check out uh, Dr. Prince's book. We, we'd love to recommend our guest work and, and we trust you'll be richly blessed uh, by doing so. But until next time, we wish you grace and peace. God bless. <laughs>